Hey, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural Ag Uncensored podcast with actual host this time. This is my first episode. I am your host, Nathan Felighty. If you haven't met me before, I guess I am me. <laughs> I uh, am a kind of a so-called appropriately cynical ag tech mentalist, as I call myself, as which you maybe see on the details. But anyways, I wanted to do a little intro before this first one, as this this podcast is a little different. The main part is I did in person with my guest, which is the new CEO of Farmer's Edge with Vibhor Aurora. And I actually don't live that far away from their main headquarters in Winnipeg. So I drove up there and actually did the interview in person. And I think it turned out okay. So, but it did go a little long, about an hour and 40 minutes. So I might break it down into two parts. You'll find that out by the time this is all put together, I guess, as I'm doing this a little bit before that. Anyways, what I wanted to do a little intro for was around just Farmer's Edge themselves. They are an enigmatic ag tech company that's been around for now, what, 19 years. And actually, I have a history of working close with them in the past when they actually first started. And so I wanted to just frame that up a little bit as it's kind of a different story with all this. It's definitely more personal. And I have been a pretty big critic of Farmer's Edge in the last 10 years once they started raising a bunch of money and doing all sorts of big things. And then things haven't worked necessarily some and and other things have gotten in the way and now they have a new CEO. And but to kind of frame it as as I, I got to know them very well and what they were doing, especially the original founders with with Wade Barnes and Curtis McKinnon. And I kind of want to just tell that story a little bit to kind of set the framework why this is different for someone like me doing it than maybe someone else, as it's a little more internal and and it goes back to uh, so many things we were doing and then where they kind of where things changed and where they went and then now where they're going. So while this podcast is going to talk about where they're at now, a little bit of the change they've had to do with the last couple of years or last year with the transition to old leadership to new leadership and then kind of where they're going, all the new tools, all that fun stuff. But we don't dive too much into the past as there's plenty out there to see. I don't need to tell you everything. You can go look at press releases or other people's comments. There's people out there that have plenty to say about it. But there's not a lot said about kind of the early years, which I call it between 2005 when they started and 2011. So to give a little context, my initial history with them started with my family's company, Satshot, and which my dad started in 1994. So he's already into this 11 years and he was actually working with a group called Double Diamond Agronomy, which Wade and Curtis were working with. And they were using our Satshot system to create variable rate maps and soil testing points for for with zones based on satellite imagery. And Wade and Curtis were interested in, you know, not working for somebody and doing their own thing. And before they actually started the company, from how my dad puts it, as, as he recollects, even it was a really long time ago, they met in the early winter of 2005. They actually came down to our little office in Maddox, North Dakota, which is about two hours south of Pilot Mound, Manitoba, where they were out of. And they sat down and tried to figure some stuff out. They wanted to use their, our program to use imagery to scale their agronomy and do it a little differently than others. Maybe I would say do it right or wrong. Just, you know, they want to do it at scale and really grow. That was always the goal. And we helped them do that. We we had the right tools to help them expand that way. And they added more agronomists and and we had a really close working partnership. It wasn't just they were using our software and they were just a client. We were, you know, hands on, very close. You know, Wade would talk to my dad two, three times a day, it seemed, from what I remember. And they were really close. Then, you know, in 2011, things things ended for our relationship. And there's a bunch of stuff I could go through there. I'm not going to do that. There's good, bad, and ugly to it all. I'll just say that. But in that time frame, when we were working close, we actually were, they were actually our Canadian exclusive dealer for a while because acres got up to 600,000 acres, I think, of in 2010, maybe a little higher even. And we were introducing them a lot, having a lot of co-meetings together. We were actually talking about them doing an exclusive through us in the United States, which led to talks about maybe we merge and maybe we build a bigger farm management system, which they ended up doing anyways. 
just without us, which is fine. It's business is how it's, it's how it works sometimes. And so it's really just an interesting time frame because, you know, without them, we probably wouldn't have got to where we were at and maybe couldn't have continued. You know, it's still alive today, but, and they maybe wouldn't have got to where they're at. I don't know. It, I'd say we were integral to ourselves in the time frames we were. We were very close. We helped each other a lot, got to know each other really well. So it kind of leads into this whole podcast of it's a little different perspective for me. And I, I kind of talk through that a little bit as, you know, there's more emotion to it for someone like myself compared to just someone interviewing them. And and the whole goal of this whole podcast in any realm is get more raw, have a more kind of dig down a little deeper, maybe more of that emotional stance into everything ag tech and agriculture, ask some different questions and get into it a little differently. But anyways, I could talk and talk about this. I just want to do a quick intro to set this up with my interview with Vipor. I think it went well and hopefully enjoy and subscribe to my YouTube channels, other podcast parts, uh, follow me on social media, comment, share, all those fun things. But without further ado, I enjoy my interview with Vipor of Farmer's Edge. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming on to my new podcast called uh, Ag Uncensored. And this is the kickoff video podcast for kind of a series of things I'm going to be do, doing. I talked a little bit about it, the previous little uh, segment here. But just to get into it, the first one, interview I'm having with the, the new CEO or fairly new CEO <laughs> of Farmer's Edge, Vipor Aurora. And, you know, with with how this came up, I'll kind of get into that a little bit, but make sure, and I'll, I'll do the normal kind of things here is subscribe, like, and, and share this post. And hopefully you guys do too <laughs> after it all. But before that, I guess to start, I think just to, to get things going, I think people just maybe want to know about you, just kind of sure. your personal, just story, you know, share from childhood if you want, you don't have to. Anything else, your likes, dislikes, family life, whatever. So I'll kick things off. And uh, once again, thanks for being on the inaugural video podcast. So, you know, thanks so much, Nathan. Uh, yeah. You know, congratulations on starting the series. And I love the name Ag Uncensored. <laughs> so, you know, good luck to you. And yeah, so, you know, maybe just a little bit about myself. And I've got a, I would say, an unconventional background. I grew up in India and I started my career in the hospitality industry back back in India. Uh, I worked for a few five-star full-service hotels, you know, in India. And how that came about was my father was in the army and he wanted me to go to the forces because my brother, who's younger to me, he went to the Indian Navy. And I was uh, I was a little bit unconventional, not trying to kind of follow the path and and hospitality management was a big thing at the time, you know, when I graduated from school. So I ended up joining hospitality management. And my first job was actually as an intern in a restaurant where I was like bussing tables for about 18 hours a day. Doesn't and sound uh, fun. yeah, and, and some, uh, you know, for some of your viewers who probably have been to India, you know, hospitality is a big thing there. The hotels are like full service hotels and, and, you know, it's, but it's a hardworking environment. And, but I learned a lot, you know, I, you know, I learned while I was bussing tables for like 18 hours a day, you know, six days a week, I learned dignity of labor, mm -hmm. you know, and my father always taught me that, you know, no job is menial and, you know, you got to grow through the ranks. And, you know, so I, that was my big lesson as part of my stint in hospitality. And I think the other piece which I learned was you always have to exceed the value that you're providing to the customers which is you have to give them value more than what they're paying you for. Mm -hmm. And and traditionally in India, customers are like, you know, they're God and we treat them, you know, really, really well. So so that kind of sentiment stayed with me. And I spent about five years in the hospitality industry uh, in India. And then I started, I shouldn't say getting bored, but I was looking at the next challenge. Sure. And, and that's when I transitioned completely you know, to a different industry, which was information technology. And I joined a company called Infosys there, which is one of the, you know, India's. I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're really big into technology development and, mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and outsourcing and, and that kind of stuff. So I was handling a, you know, global team there across five countries. And that's where I learned how to, you know, really build and commercialize, you know, cutting edge technology mm -hmm. solutions for our, for our global customers. And, you know, so, and, and I did that for five years. And then again, I had the same inkling of, you know, you trying got, to, got to do, yeah, trying to do something, you know, something new. And, and I had not done my MBA at the time. So that is when I decided to come to the U.S. to do my MBA. And so I landed in Boston and, and my plan was to actually go back to India after graduation. But, you know, the, the rupee to dollar ratio, you know, and the student loans at the time were like, you know, not in favor. Uh, and uh, and ha Amazon happened to be on campus. Oh, perfect. And, you know, how you go for, you know, these presentations at, you know, in grad school. So I happened to meet with one of the senior leaders at Amazon. And and he said, you've got an interesting background with uh, customer experience and technology and operations. And, you know, maybe it could be a fit. So, but, but, but long story short, I got hired on campus by Amazon. And I spent my first couple of years in the States as part of their operations leadership program. Okay. And so I was in Lexington, Kentucky, you know, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. And it's all relatives in Kentucky and it's, it's, it's Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's Kentucky. So, you know, they're big fans of, you know, basketball and, you know, the Derby and the Bourbon. And plus I had a great experience, you know, in, in, in the U.S. And uh, at the time they were actually looking for somebody to come to Canada. Okay. Yeah. Canada back, and this is, I'm talking about 2014, after a couple of years I spent at Amazon and and to my surprise, nobody else wanted to actually go because, you know, taxes were much higher in Canada. Sure. And, you know, the weather most places was relatively colder. So, you know, as I've always followed that unconventional path, I said I raised my hand and I said, Okay, I'll go. But I'll only go for a year and see if things don't pan out. Oh, fell you know, off. always <laughs> you know, should have the option of coming back. And so my first year in Canada with Amazon translated into a almost an eight year long stint mm -hmm. wherein uh, you know I came and I Amazon was pretty much existing but uh, you know it was about five six hundred people at the time really you know top line was in millions of dollars but you know when I saw the opportunity because Canada was at a very different adoption curve when it came to you know e-commerce adoption because people still wanted to go to Best Buys and Target, Target existed at the time in Canada and have the tactile feel of things and yeah. uh, not really order online. Well, I suppose the, the, I mean, the infrastructure roadways and all that is, it's, yeah. well, it's just different. I mean, there's, there's the one yes. made, uh, Trans-Canadian. <laughs> yes. I mean, and, but yeah, di different challenges for sure. Yeah, different challenges. Uh, the ecosystem, I would say, existed, not probably as advanced as the US, but the logistics providers were there, the internet penetration mm -hmm. was happening and. So I said, okay, this is a pretty big opportunity, you know, for this business to grow. And so over the span of eight years, my team really can be focused on delivering the right customer experience, adding a lot of selection to the Canadian website. So we diverted a lot of traffic back from the Amazon.com website back to .ca and, and the business just, you know, grew exponentially and, and. I rose to become the president for Amazon Canada Fulfillment Services. And at the time, the team had grown from about, I think, five, six hundred people back in 2014 to about close to 40,000. That's, and cool. yeah, that's, that's a lot of people. And, 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 and so that was a fantastic experience in terms of, you know, how you truly scale the, you know, customer experience in a different, different market. And, and I spent a decade by the time at Amazon and, and again, you know, trying to look for, you know, what's the next challenge and what's... But you you were used to the know, cold by by this point in time. and You know, it ended in Toronto, but... Oh, well, that's, just, the, that's not, not, not cold. But, but then you know, I couldn't handle the cold in Toronto. I'm sure, yeah. So, yeah. so we ended up moving to Vancouver. So I'm based out of Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, British Columbia. And so it was interesting that we were supposed to go back, but then ended up staying here. The business became big and... You know, but but then I was deep down, I was very proud of what I was able to do at Amazon, but was looking for a opportunity, not actively looking, but back of my mind, I wanted to, you know, get involved with something which was 
I would say more meaningful, mm-hmm. but also have that angle of technology wherein I could kind of bring in my expertise. And and that's when coincidentally I happened to meet the founder of Fairfax, you know, at a you know social in a social set, social setting, and they were looking for somebody to come to Farmers Edge and. Farmers Edge, you know, was not on the radar at the time for me. Yeah, so you so you didn't really know much about yeah agriculture and, and yes. kind of the modern sense around everything. Yes. Like just randomly yes. driving by and yes, and didn't know of the the history and and everything. Absolutely, and that. yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, keep going. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and when I looked at uh, you know Farmers Edge as a company, obviously it was at a different scale and different point, and mm-hmm. Fairfax had just. I would say taken it public the year before in 2021, but but when I then I then I started looking at the macro opportunity, you know, just all these industry reports indicate the macro challenges around you know food gap, land gap, you know, sustainability mm-hmm. challenges. But then I dove a little bit deeper and saw okay, what has technology kind of done in ag, you know, all along, and I I was surprised at the number of players which existed within ag tech. Yeah, it's a, it and it went from like. Because I've been around it since like '94, since my my father first created his yeah. company, Southshot, and for I don't know, probably up to like 2010, 11. Yeah, it was kind of like a good old boys network. There was like 50 of us, 50 right. of us right. kind of groups, and we yeah. all go to the same conferences. Yeah, and it would fit into a kind of a, a generally smaller hotel. Yeah, <laughs> and then things went crazy. Yeah. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of dive into that a little later just with with yeah. you know, the growth of, yeah. of everything but but uh so yeah so I was excited about you know the number of players in the in the in the ecosystem but at the same time the the narrative was quite you know the opposite in terms of the value the ag tech you know solutions mm-hmm. have created and you know and then it just kind of made perfect sense looking at farmers edge and technology and some of the history because this was also I would say a turnaround opportunity and I've always been entrepreneurial, you know, within my, you know, career. So that's when I thought, okay, this is a perfect opportunity with the backing of a, you know, partner like Fairfax, you know, to kind of, you know, tie in all the pieces of where my background can help and, you know, what basically the industry needs in terms of, you know, new solutions and perhaps I would say in a much more simplified manner. So, so I joined Farmer's Edge and, uh, in June of 2020, you know, two, and since then we've kind of kept our heads down, trying to really optimize the business model, really listen to the customers, and I'll dive into a little bit more. Yeah, you know, and in the yeah. so so I mean I think one of the just kind of a there's there's a little thing I remember hearing back when when Fairfax first got into investing in the Farmers Edge, and it was from another colleague who who knew the owner quite well and right i mean it was kind of when i mean stocks were just going up crazy investment firms were making money big exits and all this and and uh and once the deal happened <laughs> apparently he said to the main owner of fairfax he's like he's like he didn't even know it happened it was like there i guess we have too much money and things are going really well so hey let's join into the fun it was kind of a surprise but but not a surprise because you know they were looking into getting into to act technology but i, I just yeah. remember that little thing and and you know seeing seeing where everything's gone i mean clearly yeah fairfax has been putting a lot down and yeah i mean even with some of the yeah the tough tough numbers and and changes and all that they seem to be like hey we're we're in this and doing this and i mean do you feel that kind of you coming from an outside perspective is is that's the reason because things were maybe too internally in ag and they were maybe a little worried that that wasn't enough or things could get too, I can't think of the word right now, but maybe almost closed minded because you're too much into ag. I mean, I, I realize that myself sometimes I'm like, yeah. I didn't think of it that way yeah. from a larger business sense. Do you, do you think that's that was part of the, part of the idea of bringing someone like you on? Yeah, I think I would think so. But I think the bigger, you know, objective was to really make sure that, you know, farmers are just one of their investments you know they are going to be in it for the long run, mm-hmm. and and I know Prem and I met him several times. He's a role model for uh, for a lot of us here in Canada, and and he's a true believer in in building Canadian champions. Mm-hmm. And and I think all of us understand, you know, collectively that you know the macro opportunity still exists. 
it's you know the you know how do you overcome kind of the near term challenges and and still kind of keep a long term view and and they've been I would say quite pleased with the the progress that we've made in the last year and a half sure. in terms of the positive changes on culture and on execution and so on and so forth and uh, you know that's why they've kind of now offered to take the company private which is which is also you know probably a good decision in the near term in terms of you know how we want to operate yeah and and we'll we we'll can we'll you know, get into to the weeds i suppose a little more here but kind of to 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 switch gears a little bit so getting into kind of how how we met <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should open the story. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, as, as as people are probably listening, I I I I call myself an appropriately cynical ag tech mentalist, which in itself makes I don't I don't even know what that is, but it, I like it. But yeah, I, I've been a little more poignant towards issues in the ag industry, but especially the technology industry because I've been in a lot. I've seen a lot of things. I mean, there's. And, and I'll illustrate, maybe talk a little bit up before this, you know, the start here and then a little bit into it. But I was there at the beginning of when Farmer's Edge started. And when I was younger, when a lot of new things came on and I could see a lot of things work, things not work, you know, you get the ups and downs. There's there's no shortage of stories. <laughs> Hence why I'm doing this is to kind of get other people on to illustrate those stories, the good and bad, why this didn't work, the mistakes made. And just talk about it in a in a real sense, because while a lot of other things can kind of get lost in marketing, right? And everyone's got to do it. I mean, yeah. and and the video getting to that, everyone's got to do that. Put out a video saying, "Hey, we're doing this and and whatnot," and 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 that's kind of where this started. Is uh, you guys put out a video, and, and you're a public company, you got to put something out. But a, as I do, I I kind of look into it a little deeper. And I think with all the crazy things that even happened within Farmers Edge the last 10 years, for sure, once money, more, a bunch of money came in and expansion and all that, and some things worked, some things didn't. And then with the going public and, and, you know, the price dropping a lot, people were like, what the hell's going on? And so I think I, I put kind of my inner ear to, to the broad sense of ag tech and saying, I want to hear more, like minute 45 video it's like and and you haven't done a lot of like i said marketing and yeah. exposure because you're trying to kind of loop things in and, and kind of reorganize reset whatnot so so i get that but it's like i want more and so so i made a little repost and and i can't even remember the words on it someone can look it up if they want or i'll maybe post a link on it on the video or something yeah but i think what was different you know usually when i do that uh, the the ceo from the other company you know be it fbn or indigo or others that I've, I've kind of criticized they'll reach out to me and say hey how are you who are you i would like to meet you we should talk and i think that's a big for me at least being in this is a big just change in it all from what you know i'd see before is because you're you understand that i mean as you said in the message hey we're open to being criticized there's there's a Everyone is, but it's how, how you kind of roll with it after that, that I think is really important because I think that's one of the problems in, in ag technology is yes, some of it's new, not a lot of, not everything's worked and, and people have had a really hard time taking criticism in it. And so I applaud you for that is, is reaching out. And then, you know, we met and a thing kind of sparked with me and I've always been wanting to do kind of a, a podcast or something like that. And it's like, well, this would be a great opportunity to kind of launch something off. You know, there's there's an interesting storyline as as me and, and my dad and our, our family's company was involved in the beginnings of of Farmer's Edge back in actually before it started in 2005 and up till 2011. A lot of great things, expansion, kind of you know, it was smaller then, and a lot of fun things, and got to know the you know the former founders, Wade and Wade and Curse, really well. But then, you know, things change and there's been a lot going on and it's like, there's a story to tell here. And I think a lot of people got caught up in, yeah, what didn't work? And and, and I'll dive into that a little bit. Some of the things that did, some, some things that didn't. So I think it's just worth a good story to talk about and get real and get a little uncensored as <laughs> totally <laughs> yeah. remote. So, yeah. You know, and, and so diving into kind of, I guess. So, so let me. Oh, make, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. You yeah. know, let me make a quick comment there because uh, 
because i'm glad that you that you commented you know on the video and and you know i I've, i've always kind of you know lived my personal professional life and there's usually very little kind of <clears throat> you know distinction in in the way i approach both these aspects of my life but you know some of the things which are extremely important to me is you know whenever there's a problem we want to address it head on right i agree and yeah and not behind hide behind the scenes because because one is it's an opportunity to tell the story mm-hmm. and often to correct the narrative if the story is not not accurate and in your case the story was absolutely you know accurate and there's a history with uh, you know the company and and all of us are aware and and we are trying to be now forward looking and you know with with what future holds for us but you know i think trust integrity honesty are you know core to at least my value system Yeah. and my team's value system so we thought it was you know the best approach in that scenario you know wherein there is a criticism is you you know reach out and have a transparent honest conversation and i'm and i'm also happy that you commented because then that's how we got to know each other right and yeah, I, I, we are here doing this yeah you know, and, podcast, so and i think you know. that's one of the things that sometimes those things just lead to to the next thing and the next right. thing and like i said I think there was a story needed to be told. I don't know if that could have been told before or not, at least by me. I'm not sure about that, but you know, here we are. So, I hope it continues. I mean, so any any other CEOs out there looking, let's uh let's do something. I don't know if it'll be in this format exactly. I live pretty close to uh to Winnipeg, so <laughs> So, okay. So, we went over kind of kind of the base base pieces of, you know, how you got here, your background and everything. And I mean, all on the surface, this is, I mean, like I said, when I met you, I, mean, I was, I was, it was a present exp- or a great experience as like, this is kind of refreshing. And, and I know there's also, you know, this, this history of, of what did happen. So one of the questions uh, I think that a lot of people have is, you know, there's a lot going on, different development and, and this or that, like, what was day one like? and like what was the first week first month like what how did that whole progression go cuz because i know when we talked before you mentioned you looked at some things were like okay that that needs to change like right away yeah. and other things like okay that's going to take some time but can you talk through more of you know what you saw right away and then kind of what changes were immediate and what you know things kind of have shifted from the before the poor times yeah No I think it's a great question and I'm actually going back to that you know day one when I came in and so I'm I've always throughout my career I've never taken I would say I've taken quick decisions but not without really observing things and trying to you know make sure that the anecdotes that I'm hearing from mm-hmm. from the field they're actually matching the data and but what was very evident to me from the time I stepped in was there was a lot of passion in the employees that sure. you know people wanted to, all the team members you know they wanted to do well they wanted to make sure the company is successful and they believed in you know the mission that they were on which is which is not always common place when you're going through a situation like you know the company was going through which was a big positive so so i was super happy about that the second piece which was also you know very kind of immediately clear was just the robustness of the technology solution the farm command platform and all the other predictive analytics the soil intelligence so on and so forth variable rate technology the the hardware implementation that was almost like cutting edge in fact you know ahead of its time there yeah there was a lot of, of you know, good pieces yeah it seemed there was a lot of pieces yeah like yeah. too many to almost manage yeah. properly or market properly there's yeah. a lot going on yeah so so and exactly so those two pieces are very very clear and and then what was also becoming increasingly clear to me that i i say this in a different way what you just said is we had a problem of plenty like mm-hmm. we had some like 80 plus initiatives on the technology roadmap yeah and uh, for the size of you know this company it's you know or for any company for that matter it's there's so much of scope creep you know then you keep shifting priorities you know from month to month and then the teams kind of really don't have clear direction in terms of what's urgent versus important mm. and near term versus short term and so that was basically my initial kind of 
actions to was to just kind of remove a lot of noise you know focus on what we are as a company which is we are a technology company and we want to be the technology enabler for everybody who's got anything to do with you know with agriculture whether it's a grower whether it's the ag retailers or the co-ops or large enterprise partners mm-hmm. and and i think so clarifying that you know reason why we exist was was paramount and 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 we launched something called one farmers edge plan and see the little signs all yeah you see little signs yeah <laughs> so you know so I'm, i'm a big believer that you know you have to really focus on the culture mm-hmm. apart from you know all the typical business strategy and execution pieces and because culture in my opinion is my definition is like values and behaviors so we kind of articulated you know a set of seven values and one of them is really focusing on the customer and listening to the customer and you know basically delivering on what they want so so we made you know those kind of pivots but over a period of time i think you know we were able to really narrow in the focus and focus on like to give you a data point like we have like four things on the technology roadmap right now versus the 80 that we have previously well that's that's a that's a nice change well yeah. it, it it reminds me of back in i i can't remember the year it's probably like 2020 or 2021 <laughs> it's a press release that was put out it's like here's the 99 things we're going to do this yeah. next like quarter or something and i was like whoa that's a lot like cool if it all happens you know yeah. that's grand but it's like that's like i've done software development or you know manage program management market sell all this like it was just a lot and it was it was like I guess to the to a point is maybe like you said you're you know listening to the customers like sometimes you can listen too much to the customers especially in in the technology scope cuz and I've seen this with lots of companies and everyone's to blame I'm to blame and 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 aspects of of my career too and cuz you don't want to say no but sometimes especially you know you go into a field of the farmer and you're like oh I'd really like it if this or you know I I want this to work better and you're like Yeah, I we all want that, but yeah. You know, in a lot of cases like, well, you know, the software costs what it is and, you know, the data pieces cost what it is, the service costs what it is. Right. And and many times, you know, especially in in ag, cuz there's there's a disconnect with development of software and tech and kind of the real world of farming at times. And I I found that I think especially with a lot of the influx of money that's came in the last 10 years from VCs what not we maybe tried to just do too much because farmers were like I want this agronomists were like I want this and this and and it's really expensive to develop right and it's really time consuming which is time is money and then it, yeah. it creates this complexity and I think that's some of what where some of the the challenges you know during the the kind of build up expansion of farmers edge before kind of ran into it's like well we could do this we could do this this customer says hey we'd pay 100 grand if you do this and then you get into it and and at the end of it you're like holy crap we didn't make any money we just lost money yeah cuz you don't want to say no cuz you want to get ahead of the next person or the next person it, it's a i think we're all finding that kind of as a ag tech reset of sorts which i've kind of called out for years and it's kind of starting to happen yeah but it's it's refreshing to know that that you were like hey let's let's just focus on some things because i think that's where everyone's getting to because that's where you got to be yeah. so i mean getting into you know your first days weeks i'm guessing you, have you talked to like basically every employee and kind of just get to know them and stuff like that i i'd assume i would say most of them yeah because initially i was on a field trip and i went to meet the customers the employees visited the labs in fact last week i was in uh, iowa for a, for a business meeting visited visited our soil testing lab there and it's an amazing facility like you know cutting edge best in class super proud about you know what we're doing with the lab and the soil testing space a cup in december i was in brazil mm-hmm. so that that's another you know growth market for us and i met a lot of customers there for a relatively smaller team there but really passionate you know individuals trying to make a difference so so yeah it's uh, it's been quite insightful i would say <laughs> so w- one thing I- i'll ask so i mean clearly like i said there's you know old uh, original leadership w- left what two years ago or so and then you know looking they're looking for new new people 
other people probably left for different reasons, whatever turnover. What was, is there kind of like a, maybe a sentiment or maybe not sentiment, not the right word, but a descriptor of how people, how the employees, especially after time, you know, half a year or whatever compared kind of the previous leadership or the process, maybe just the, the, the management process overall and, and how it's changed. Like, is there like a, a specific descriptor? I have one in mind that we kind of talked about on our call and, but you know, it's, cause it seems like there's a different mentality. And yeah. I guess, what, is there a comparative kind of descriptor that, that you could um, talk more on that? I yeah, guess. no, absolutely. And, and I'm sure there are quite a few actually, you know, comparables and, and I think, uh, for for what it's worth, like in all fairness, I think you know we don't want to delve into the past issues, you know, quite yeah, quite yeah. a bit. But but I think the other pieces, even some of the market conditions which were there, you know, when the previous leadership was was running the company, you know, like carbon for that matter, right? So those promises did not really pan out because mm-hmm. of you know just the regulatory environment or how you know things have panned out, right? So you know, so I just want to make sure that. It was not all about, I would say, just execution. But I think what I think the employees will say, or they are telling us now through our, you know, feedback surveys. And I've, I've done, I don't know what, over 12, 13 town halls since the time I came in, because okay. I want to make sure that all of our, you know, team members are informed as to, you know, where we are and where we are going. So I think about, I addressed the culture piece, you know, before, but I think on the specific strategy and execution, you will see a very clear alignment in terms of, you know, where we are going with our services, which is the market we want to cater and and what do we want to do, which is basically to keep it simple. We want to offer the best in class technology solutions. We don't want to be, we want to be complementary in the marketplace with all of, you know, mm-hmm. the other partners. We don't want to be really be competitive, which has been the case in the past. Well, yeah, there, there was a, I mean, that was always one of the challenges that I always, always see. And it kind of illustrates a main one. And I, you know, there's some major, I'd say kind of points in time with the, the history of Farmer's Edge. And I, I think of it, you know, from being in the beginning when, 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 like I said, my family's company was there, we were, I mean, it was kind of a grassroots effort. Like, yeah. Hey, let's, let's get some imagery, build some zone, do some soil testing. <laughs> yeah. And let's just go out and do something and yeah. let's do some scouting. And then, right. you know, they would add some other softer pieces, other data. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, it was pretty straightforward. It was a service. Yes. And, and we were helping with that service. And then things kind of expand a little bit. That's near when we were ending with them. So when the soil lab came on, there was expansion into you know, Russia and the Eastern Bloc countries, old Soviet, I mean, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. And, and it's, a lot of that started kind of actually in 2007 for Agritechnica. Right. We were kind of building up to that as we connected Wade at the time with, with a colleague of ours, Howard Dahl, who opened up mass expanses of, of machinery in, into the, the former Soviet Union. And, you know, Agritechnica was this huge opportunity and, mm-hmm. and 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 there's a whole other story i could <laughs> it's a it's a different story it's a fun story nothing wrong of course and and actually after that i was waiting up going to 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 russia to another conference and, and his translator ended up turning into his wife and and is at his wedding and everything and like i said i'm not i won't get into all the specifics but a, a lot of things you know it started expanding into that and then you know we were always talking about building you know more, about larger software but yeah there's different reasons why it didn't or didn't happen but then that that kind of expanded into that and and so and then like the first investment kind of round they did you know as big but to the point you know beyond you know for things kind of almost overreaching the the stuff with planet labs or planet and and the data like that's a big poignant moment i, w- I was thinking on the right up here and there's been other moments like that where it's like hey let's do this because of we want to, you know, to that competitive advantage, like we're competing with everybody. Yeah. And it turned into, well, okay, we'll distribute it. We'll do this big exclusive. And it was like a super expensive deal and a long term. And it, it kind of turned into this, well, others don't want to distribute with you because you're our competitor. Mm-hmm. And that became a just a, a broad scale problem. 
And I think, I mean, just that, that deal in itself, it kind of this build up to like some of that. It was, it, I think every, the, I think there was a, a meaning of this is a good thing to do. This is, will build us up. And, but it, it kind of hurt and it, and it even hurt, it hurt other parts of the industry, especially around the, the earth observation space. So, you know, it, it sounds like to me that you're kind of, you're looking deeper into it than maybe before saying, like you said, we don't want to be competitive. So yeah. to what degree would you say you're, you are unique? that you're not competitive in or yeah. what are those things? Cause before there seemed like a lot and you said, you know, there's different changes, things you've taken away. What, what are those things that you don't feel are competitive in the marketplace right now? Or you guys are kind of out there. Yeah. And, and I, and I say that we, we want to be complimentary and, and not being competitive. It's just because, you know, the nature of the challenges, whichever challenge you want to pick up, like, you know, there's a place for everybody and everybody can, yeah. you know, kind of exist together, right? Because at the end of the day, when I think about the growers and the number of, you know, technologies and things that they have to deal with, and they're running pretty much, you know, their own companies and managing their P&Ls oh, yeah. and, yeah. you know, and, and dealing with the controllables and also the uncontrollables, which means even if they do everything right, the outcomes may still not be where, you know, they need to be, right? Which is, yeah. which is you know, which is a tremendous opportunity on how farmers edge as a company and plus how a lot of these other players can kind of help. But I think just specifically talking about the competition piece, like in the past we've, you know, the companies tried hands in selling kind of, you know, imports or selling insurance products like which are like typically traditional products. And yeah. and, and we are very clear now that we want to just help people in the agriculture community with our technology solutions. So we want to be in the background being the enabler. Sure. Yeah. Right. And now, does that mean if if we are able to work with another technology provider to, you know, offer better value to our end customer, we absolutely will do it. Sure. And and I'll and I'll give you an example. So I, I was in India in in January. We recently launched an innovation lab with our partner called LTI Mindtree, and the whole idea is how do we custom customize the farm command solution for that Indian market. Sure, and and the farms are smaller. You know, the, yeah, yeah. The pricing power, like the buying power, purchasing power, is very different. Mm -hmm. How do you work with the enterprise partners? And and we are actually, you know, having discussions with other ag tech providers who are there in India who probably don't have technology which is as sophisticated as ours, but they have the lo local nuance and local knowledge, right? Yeah, and that, so, that's that's a huge, yeah. you know, point. And and I think you know part of that was trying to be built out. It was trying to be built out before because, you know, there's a spread. Let's get agronomists in different states right. and build that. And, but it was, it was kind of, it got to a touch point. It's like, okay, we're working with the farmers and the seed dealers or we're having like, there was just so many yes. pieces. Like we're directly with the farmers. We're just competing yeah. against the co-op that has this other software service, totally. but yet yeah. we're trying to work with them yeah. in this larger sense. And yes. it became confusing. Uh, yeah, I was I was people. We, just, was, we confuse the reason. customers. We confuse <laughs> the partners. And, you know, there's like so many partnership press releases, you know, and, you know, it's just, you know, that that's not an optimal way to approach, you know, any market for that matter, you know, yeah. leave alone agriculture. And I mean, and, and part of that can easily happen because I mean, just with, I mean, Farmer's Edge wasn't alone in this is, I mean, a lot of money raised and yeah. you just, you're trying to, f you're kind of finding, trying to find product market fit, fit right. and to do that. Yeah, you gotta throw a lot of sticky things on a wall and see what sticks. Yeah. Like I, I get it, but of course in ag, it does, it's a little different just because of the the slow nature of things. Yeah, and and yeah, of course now through that, call it the the last ten years, you've you're 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 finding out what didn't. You found out what didn't work a, a lot. I mean, there's there's variations in that. I think the list of lessons learned is long. You know, and uh, both yeah. internally as a company, and and but also as you know, as an industry and as a market, and but I still remain very, very optimistic, and I call myself a, a rational optimist. You know, as as my team kind of knows it, but any customer, and I've, I don't know how many, I think I flew about seventy thousand miles last year. You know, meeting customers, meeting you know our, our partners, and 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 I think there is still 
that in spite of, I would say, I shouldn't say a burnout, maybe that's a negative word, but the fatigue which has happened in ag tech with I, multiple I, I think it's a burnout. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have experienced in multi different levels over the years. Yeah. So appreciate the but, v- validation, I would say, then. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, the passion keeps everyone yeah. alive. And there's a lot of passion in all yeah. those agriculture. So yeah. it, it keeps us going. Yes. And I'm a new person coming to agriculture, but I've, you know, built businesses in, in other industries before. And the fundamentals are here also, you know, the same. But whenever I'm talking to the customers and talking about the solutions and in a way that is easily understood, in a way, it's palatable. In a way that it creates economic slash commercial value for them, they're all ears. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that gives me a lot of confidence in terms of, you know, just validating that our strategy, you know, we are on the right path. And then if we are able to execute and make sure that we are delighting the customer by creating value for them, we will be able to capture a portion of that value, you know, as a company, mm-hmm. right? And that's what is going to, you know, make us successful in the long run. So, so- so going into, you know, we've gone through kind of this bits and pieces of the whole story here. And there are some pieces that, that I've, I've talked to some other colleagues and cause I, I, I mentioned to them, they're like, Hey, would you ask this? So I have a few questions from some outsiders. Sure. I, I, I have a long list. I will get to them all, but one is this, and, 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 and I don't know if this is a carryover thing or, or what, but I, I'm assuming there's some legacy things from the past i mean there's i know there's some things from maybe past legal things or there's past contracts or whatever but one question was what is your message to farms that sign multi-year agreements for full service and local staff support and now that the corporate strategy has changed to more virtual with fewer offers of staff and, and industry so is is there still a kind of a transition phase from 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 that or how are you approaching that I'm glad you asked because I think there's a there's, there's I would say a, a bit of a I shouldn't say confusion but lack of clarity I would say so when we pivoted to the virtual model that was we segmented our customer base into different markets mm-hmm. like the primary markets will have full service there's no change okay. the secondary markets was digital because you know because there was a lot of fragmentation economically it did not make sense for us to provide the experience that we wanted to provide to our customers sure, sure so all of those customers in the secondary market were actually given that option to either move to a digital service because we clearly like i said transparently we told them you know this is a plan going forward mm-hmm. and 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 we've seen a good i would say traction with you know, our customers understanding, okay, that's the case. and But obviously there are pockets and pieces where, you know, it does not meet the requirement and plus there's no other local, you know, player. And, and we've made some exceptions in terms of how we continue to kind of support them for a little bit of an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. But if there are specific customers, you know, I'm happy to, you know, have them reach out to me and we can take a I, specific I, I can imagine if, there, if you have some, some of those customers there, they've reached out already or no, trying, to, trying to figure that out. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always going to be some some legacy things from transferring from one vision to another or yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. I think, Nathan, I think we... As a company goes through a turnaround and as, as we go through all these different changes strategically to make sure we are creating value for the end customer, there will always be examples like this. But my general notion is that we don't want to run into an expectation mismatch as we you know move forward. We want to, we wanna, our sale do ratio has to be completely intact, right? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so... And uh, but have them please reach out to me and and if we are able to you know make things work for them we absolutely would and if we're not we'll at least be transparent in how we are kind of going to deal with them so yeah no that yeah. that I make sense I mean because yeah. every I mean every company like I said regardless of how it's changed or leadership or just vision or whatever there's yeah there's it's all a little loose ends that you got to yeah. tie up and I understand that hundred percent another question so. And I, I think I, I I know there's probably so much you can talk to, but you know from from some of the past things and and they're ongoing. There's you know some legal cases. You know there was before the farm mobile stuff. I think most of mm-hmm. that's got figured out. Maybe there's some other stages to that, or you know there's another one with precision weather solutions. Is there anything you can speak to that? Because I think that's a big question a lot of people have in general. Because I mean they're 
they're they're what they are. They're, there's yeah. lawsuits. There's this right, and it, and it can bring a level of okay, is that going to be detrimental to if I work with them? Or, yes, and it's and it's public. There's things out there. I'm yeah. not going to get into all the details, but is there is there anything you can speak to some of those things and how they're how they've transitioned from kind of the past and then kind of where they're at now? Absolutely, and and I'm glad you asked because these are some of the I would say hard pressing questions, right? And even if customers say we want to work with you, but we are unsure yeah. of the mm-hmm. future viability, you know, of the company because of whether it's, you know, legal concerns or other financial concerns. Uh, I do want to say this, you know, Fairfax as a, as a, you know, investor and as a backer of Farmer's Edge, they've always been in their investments for the long run, right? And uh, And I probably wouldn't be in this, you know, placed given just the uncertainty which was there, you know, with the co- with the company, if Fairfax had not kind of assured us that you know they will you know continue to back it up, and and things can change, but directionally, I think we feel that we are in a really good spot, you know, with the changes that we've made in the last you know year and a half, mm-hmm. and with regards to the you know legal stuff, I mean, I mean you know it, you're from technology industry, you know these type of lawsuits. Are, are kind of commonplace, but we, everyone that there's money around wants yeah. to do someone else's yeah. money, and, yeah. and, and it gets it gets messy, and, and yeah. it becomes, you know, I, I won't I won't say whether what is right or wrong, and some of those things, like I said, they're they're, they're legacies. Yeah, like we we're just talking about. Yeah, so but there are so, things that happens. Yeah, so so I mean, obviously, it's it's an ongoing kind of you know lawsuit, so I can't you know speak much, but we remain very confident mm-hmm. in our position in terms of you know where we are on yeah. all of those kind of counterclaims or whatever. And and we are happy to kind of work with individual customers, especially enterprise customers. If there are questions around continuity, we are happy to put it out there as part of the contract that we'll help them kind of transition out, if at all in an unlikely scenario, you know, there would be, a, you know, I would say a less optimal outcome for Farmer's Edge. Well, I, I think that, I mean, that's a, that's a good note because I, I know of personal groups that are yeah. that is one of those questions and if you know if you're saying hey here's this and this and this yeah. if this happens yeah I mean, it's maybe the best you can do and, yeah. and you know it's at least honest yeah i think that's that's a, a big difference from maybe whether before it was maybe kind of let's let's just keep this over here i think being open yeah. and honest like okay this is a thing like we got to deal yeah. with it is is a good path yeah so it's got a, a few more just general questions from some others yeah i mean as for maybe just before i lose my thought you know i would also say this that a company like fairfax they've got a portfolio of investments they wouldn't offer to take us private if you know they did not you know yeah yeah, that's a that's a good point i mean yeah they they know yeah so they so they know and based on discussions i've had with them and and i think personally like it in spite of my kind of unconventional career path this was opportunity which was you know it's it's wouldn't have been on my radar so if i left a company like amazon you know running a large organization being the president of the country to come and you know work here it's you know i truly believe in the mission that we are on and i truly believe that you know this company has you know a positive future and 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 we're going to make it work so you know well and 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 to that point and i think you've spoken to it but you know from 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 farmers to different agronomists, maybe even different past workers in in the company. And I think one one message when I've talked to others just throughout for a long time is, especially more recently, you know, there's there's a trust issue, and I think you've spoken a lot to how you're trying to regain that trust. But is there anything else that you'd want to speak to that of other methods that you're working on to kind of Yes. Open the door back up to maybe some of what the original visions were and, and where they maybe got kind of offshooted. But what are some of the other things you, you guys are doing yeah. about that? That's another great question because, like I said, we had, you know, a lot of things on the technology roadmap. So that nuance really just did not stay internal. It also had eventually translated to the external ecosystem, like with the customers. Mm-hmm. Because we've got this solution and that solution, we can do this. Because because I think just to be fair, the interoperability and the adjacencies with technology can be just, you know, that list can be long to the point of confusing the heck out of our country. You can only integrate with so many integrations to right. integrate with integrations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the change that we've made is, 
we are really telling our customers, okay, we have these two or three offerings. If you're an individual grower, we've got fertility variable rate technology that we want to go out with, you know, because, and part of that is also our soil testing services. So that's a must have for you because a lot of digital solutions at this, you know, stage also, even in 2024, are probably not a must have. You know, people want to see what they are and, you know, what value can they provide. Plus there's a learning curve and an adoption curve. And, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, bits and pieces where you know, yeah it's a nice to have like yes oh, need that but that's nice and yes but there are some core things and, and i mean yes. you've always had some of those core things yes so we're staying to the core things and so soil testing for example right we will launch we've already kind of started talking about it in the market but we'll officially lo- launch our kind of lab and soil testing services and we are going out to the customer and saying we'll give you a faster turnaround we'll give you a cheaper price point but over a period of time, we will help you reduce the cost of soil sampling through our, you know, virtual soil testing, you know, technology that we have, okay. right? So that's pretty simple and it is not confusing. And, you know, so that's like one offering, you know, that we're going to launch. Well, it sounds like kind of like a new, I mean, as we were talking earlier, I, I was there back in the day when they bought the first soil lab, which yes, is right east of town here. Yeah. And <laughs> it was, I mean, yeah, it was, it was a big it didn't, it made sense at the time. It was a big yeah. shift because they were doing a lot of stuff through Agvis at the time and, and going across the border. There was just, there's a lot of just different reasons. Yeah. And that was always one question that I was like, why aren't they diving into that more? See, thing? yeah. And, See, and there's that, different economics yeah. of scale yeah. and it, you know, it's a yeah. lab, it's a place. Yeah. There's different infrastructure and costs, things there. Yeah. But I always thought that would have, that maybe would have been a better model to kind of link it and expand that yeah. a little more. Because it's it's needed. It's yeah. one of those core things. Yeah, that, that, that'll be interesting. And you yeah. said that new labs Same. in Iowa, like you said. Yeah, that. yeah. So so that's we've got a lab in Canada. We've got a lab in in the U.S. We've all launched an innovation lab in India, which is not soil testing, and it's an innovation lab. But but the idea is that okay, go to the customer and and give them what basically they want, right? And then plus we've got a host of other digital solutions. And if people are interested, they can you know we can add them as a bolt on. So that's on the, you know, the individual growers. For the enterprise customers and, you know, co-ops and ag retail customers, we are going to them with, you know, a simple solution, which is, and you'll hear this in the agri, you know, agri tech in San Francisco next month. We're planning to launch something called managed services, yeah. which is because these big companies, you know, or small companies, relatively any enterprise company, you know, one is they have a very critical decision to make whether they build the technology in-house, but they don't have the expertise or they buy it from somewhere, but yeah. the off-the-shelf solutions don't make sense, cannot be customized, etc., cetera, et cetera. So we are trying to go to them and say, okay, you know, this is our base fundamental core solution. We can build derivatives based on what you require. We can help, you know, license, white label it. And, so, you know. So, okay, that's a that's an interesting theme. Yeah, I know there was always kind of that's his group, by the way. That it's it's it's, it's in concept, you know, it's in conception, you know, stage right well, now. I've always kind of thought that was, and I I remember hearing like rumblings of maybe doing something like that in the past because there were so many different pieces you guys were building. Yeah, but at the time, like we talked earlier, there was kind of more we'll we'll compete against some of the other parts, which and just you know don't kill through expansion yeah. and marketing yeah. and all that. Yeah. Which I mean, it it is what it is, but. But I will say though, I've dealt in that space a lot. So, because yes. where I used to, where I worked from before was with uh, Ag Integrated, which was dealing with a lot of background APIs, exchanges, data translation. And then it got bought by Telus, you know, the, the one of the largest companies in, right. in, uh, in Canada. And that was a big, that was the big thing is, okay, we'll build these back end because we, we got this software, we got this. So we'll have all these back end pieces. And what's, I wonder if, if if people have talked to you about this, and this is just a personal observation that I've dealt with, is there seems to be a want, in a sense, to do that, to say, okay, yes, building that component would cost me you know, $5 million. I can license it for $250,000 or something like that. Or right. Whatever. Yeah. On paper, seems great. Yeah. One thing I always kind of found, though, is is it's really hard to get the other group to have the internal people that want to own it. 
Yes. And it, it's, it's more, it almost became more of a political thing. Yeah. You could talk to a major ag retailer and be like, okay, we could do these and these modules. You're, you're, you want these 10 things, we can do, say, seven of them, mm -hmm. and we can guide you with the other three. Or, hey, there's another group over here that can do the other three. Or maybe you build it yourself. And there almost became this inner political process in fighting over, you know, a program. Be like, I can build that. I can do it in this many hours. Yeah. Or you don't need to do that. You know, we can do that. We just got to add this little line of code or something, which it's never that easy as you've done the yeah, technology. It's, 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 but that's what that's what the challenge always was. And then, you know, you get into license fees and they can build up. And then it's like, oh, I got to support the extra pieces on top of those modules. And it almost became like this for, and I, I've known groups that have been trying to do it or have, have tried and it almost becomes like, it can become this inner collapsing star. Totally. Really totally. fast. So totally. do, you're aware of that. So that's a good, that's a good story. Yeah, your observation is spot on. And, and when I go back to my time in Infosys, the change management internally in an organization, you know, which is trying to give you this type of project mm -hmm. or, and, and then manage it. It's it's very hard, but but I think we've got a good idea in terms of you know some of the pointed solutions we want to offer, which is again not offering you know the whole world in terms of we can change everything, but really customizing it based to you know on their on their need, but also have an element of how we take them through that change management process because that's the most scary well, thing, right? Well, you almost need like a uh, you almost need like coaches, yeah, like. Just someone that's been like through different parts be like, right. All right. I'm just going to sit with you. Yes. <laughs> and make sure you don't overthink it. Yes. And follow. Yeah. So, a process. so and, and that's an excellent point because you just don't need a salesperson who will sell you the deal and then a technology person who will build it. You, feel you, that, you, do that. you need that interface yeah. in between who will take them along and, and, you know, whether it's an account manager or a program manager or whatever, a product manager, and and why we think we are really positioned well to do that is because Fairfax spent over a hundred million dollars on the R and D of this company just to build you know the solution right mm -hmm. over the years. So we have this unique combination of having in field ag expertise plus the soil labs plus fertility offerings, along with the technology you know expertise that we have, right? And and that because you you can challenge me and and counter that by saying. Okay, what like there are multiple technology providers who can do the same, but not a whole lot of them have this you know depth of in field experience that you know we bring to the table. Well, the one thing you know I'll say, and it, and it's maybe it's maybe kind of a scary point is some of doing that from where I came from. Tell us, they're I think they're still doing parts of that, but a lot of that whole thing from more of the precision ag side, call of it, right? Uh, they basically dropped doing that yeah and and then you know they're buying i think pro agriculture it's that's being worked on that was a big thing that they wanted to do that was you know, there's been plays that time of course if you can learn from that and, and understand that it's a needed thing it's yeah. just and maybe that's you know going going private maybe you can you can handle that a little differently because those other groups they were i mean tell us as a whole and then there's tell us ag and there's tell us all these other pieces, yeah. it almost is too much. It's just like it's too, too much. much. And, 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 and I don't know, like maybe would. give me your two cents on how you think that those integrations have happened, you know, and, and are they successful, right? And it's... Well, in, in those sense, I mean, when I was there, I mean, there was like three, in three years, it was 15 companies and like 1,500 people coming together. It, right. It's it's hard. I mean, it was, that was a, that's a big task on its own. And yeah. then, you know, even from where, Relics group, I think they don't prior. I mean, they're a bigger group beyond that too. So I, I think maybe that's, it's one of those things. I think if you can address that early, you know, with like Fairfax is supporting us on this, but they're not like being the ones doing it. Like we're doing, we're going to do the job and trying to learn from it. So, you know, that, that's interesting. And I, like I said, I'm sure more will come out on that. And, you know, just as, as we're talking through this, you know, the, that expansion. So I, in the video that I, I criticized, you know, in, in December, I, 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 I wrote down a piece here and, and tell me what it means. And maybe, maybe it means something totally different. So with going private, you know, it says increasing your cash, cash position by 50 million. What does that exactly mean and entail? I mean, there's maybe things you can say, you can't say, I don't know, but is that like, yeah. a, is that like an infusion of 
$50 million into this in going private or is it something totally different? No, no. So I was talking in the video about the free cash flow improvements, free cash flow, basically, you know, deficit that we've reduced, you know, by $50 million, you know, since the time I stopped. Okay, okay. Right. And that has come through a lot of kind of optimization of the business model, renegotiating our contracts with some of the key suppliers, like a lot of opportunities, you know, which we kind of uncovered, you know, kind of helped us you know, get to that position. And because if you look at the financials of the company, like, and it's not just Farmer's Edge, most ag tech companies are like, they're not profitable because the business model has, you know, people have not shifted quickly from the growth mode into profitability mode. Well, there's a lot to tell us and other times too. I've seen a lot of, I saw a lot of numbers and balance sheets from groups and none of them had a share. I don't even remember them anyways. Right. But no, it, it didn't look great. For, yeah, uh, somewhere closer, somewhere a little yeah. farther away, and and there's going to be yeah. a lot revealed in the maybe the next year yeah. or two. But and 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 we've done a really good job in you know really controlling our costs and being really pointed and cutting down on initiatives which you know really did not make sense you mm-hmm. know at the time, and being being kind of really laser focused and surgical on our how we managing internally and then how we trying to support our customers externally, and and I feel pretty good about you know the reduction that we've had in the deficit of free cash flow and we close that gap and once because i'm always you know of the mindset that a long-term business model has to be built on profitability and cannot be just on the growth you know side of things right because then i think the industry is shifting to yeah from this kind of yes let's mega growth boom 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 yeah i mean it affected this company for a while and yeah yeah but i see a larger shift away from that yeah i even think some investors are saying uh, we're not going to support what we used to support. Exactly. You know, it was not going to Venture money disappears as the valuation kind yeah. of depresses and tanks. And, and, and that's the natural kind of cyclic, you know, curve that you see. And, but we want to build this company for the long term, which is built on the right kind of, you know, financial fundamentals. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and like, and, and, and we want to be responsible as a company because obviously Fairfax is supporting us and we want to make sure, and I've had this discussion multiple times with, with Fairfax, like we will not shy away from making an investment wherein it's needed and it can add value to the customers and then we can capture some value versus just, you know, going out and, you know, just making investments, which. Well, you might get some, you might get some really, we were talking a little bit earlier, you might get some I mean, there's going to be some groups going for cheap soon. You might get some really good deals on yeah. some certain groups. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's a process of business. You know? yeah. It happens. So, yeah. and, and I think that answers there's some, some other questions I had on this, you know, where's Firefox on this, but they seem like they're in it for the long haul. Yeah. They want to yeah. keep it going, keep it alive, even though, I mean, yes, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in, yeah. you know, through VC, maybe some private equity. I don't know, but well, I guess, yes, with Fairfax and, you know, the public side of it. And, but to that point, you know, the one, one thing you could look at is, okay, they spent all that money and lost it. And some people do think that way. You know, I guess it's fair that some people can think that way, but there's the other side is like, well, yes, yeah, some of that money did go towards this that didn't work. But as you pointed out, it also built some things too. It built some assets. It, it it bought these things. So, and while I don't need to get in on any of the numbers of any of that fun stuff, I think it's just important to point out in general that there are assets there, and you're trying to. I mean, I I just you know the three main segments: agri food and fuel, your insurance side, e commerce side. I mean, those are your assets. Would you Would you say that? Yeah, there's a significant amount of intellectual property in the company. Mm-hmm. Apart from, I would say, the hard assets of, you know, weather stations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's, you know, so, so but, but I think apart from that, the the main reason that, like, any invest, if, it let's say, it was a different investor compared to Fairfax, th- there are enough kind of signals for them to basically, you know, just exit and say, okay, this may not work because not just farmers as, as an industry, ag tech is not really, mm-hmm. you know, taken off. But like I said earlier, like they've done it with a number of their portfolio companies, wherein the companies have, you know, had challenges in the near term, but they've kind of stayed invested and that, you know, that has worked out for them, you know, in the long run. And and some of, and they're maybe down the line could be an opportunity if things, you know, go well and the market conditions are, are in favor, you probably, you know, take the company back, you know, again, you know, 
public. It's 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 always an option, I suppose. It's, it's always an option. As long as the, the world spins. Yeah, yeah. And so they feel confident about the team that we have now, and we've got a you know relatively newer executive team, which is a combination of ag technology, business experience, operations experience, and you know. So we're I think taking the right strokes here in the company and having. A strategy match the execution to to you know turn this around. Well, and speaking of the team, how big is the team now? I mean, I know it got up into the what is it like four hundreds at some point in time yeah. or something. What are, what are yeah? How many are there now? So our last reported numbers were about I think four seventeen in in the you know at the end of last year, and then we had an op optimization which kind of reduced the headcount by about twenty percent. So okay, yeah, yeah. So, so then three hundred ish. Yes, yeah, yeah. They a lot of people to take care of. Of course, you used to so, take care of like forty thousand people. So, uh, so it's like it's, uh, that's a that's like a babysitting a, a newborn. Yeah, and no, I think uh, yeah, I think sometimes size and scale, I would say, hides inefficiencies which come to the surface. In a, you know, that is true. In a smaller setup, and you know, but uh, but we feel pretty good about. I would say, you know, the path that we are on and. And you know, the, like I said, the first thing which surprised me was just the passion of our, you know, team members who wanted to do the right thing and right, you know, mission. They just needed right direction, and I'm the one who's trying to orchestrate that for, well, for them. You know, considering all the 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 wildness of of maybe the past. I mean, anyone that's been sticking around and still sees that vision and all that, you know, mm-hmm. beyond just say a paycheck or whatever, if they see that too, I mean, I think you know that's a focus every every ag tech company should be it's like hey okay this has been crazy or there's this ups and these downs like but we still want to be here like yeah i think there you know while there's been turnover in the past or or and there's been a lot of craziness in all of ag right now anyways you know just i think focusing on the employees having passion i mean just going forward with everything you're doing is a big piece of the puzzle um, it is. general and just getting their voices out and saying yeah and you know like i said there are, there are past criticisms and all this but the more you own it and say okay fine tell me what you think <laughs> and kind of what we're doing here i think is, is it's it's refreshing to hear compared to how i feel things were before and i think the more you talk about that just that's my personal opinion the better the yeah. other things are, and I mean, that's probably for any company out there. But yeah, and you're you're so right because, you know, I would say I would say maybe we are in the second phase of our you know kind of turnaround right now because the first year we and I thought about it you know because typically the company had a lot of press releases etc. I, I stopped all of that like all marketing outreaches for the mm-hmm. first year because we wanted to keep our heads down you know just focus internally you know optimize the model optimize the offerings. You know, simplify it for employees so that they can simplify it for our customers, and and so we are out of that phase one and in phase two, that's where you know we're starting to now reach out more and you'll see us more in social media. I'm going to these conferences just to listen in because, like, I'm a lifelong learner and I'm a new person in agriculture and I want to just really, put, just you know, put a hat on <laughs> new CEO in ag tech. Like, yeah. please, so please be easy on me. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm trying to learn a lot and. And but one of the things I wanted to kind of touch upon was this whole soil testing, you know, offering that we are going out in the market. That came out of my kind of town hall with the employees, and and we have these two fantastic, you know, leaders who are running the labs, and they said, you know, there's so much of you know need in the market, and and you know why don't we go out and sell it? And and I started listening in, and and then we started to kind of run some numbers, and it was just you know like eye opening, so. And now we're launching it with our, you know, full kind of marketing I mean, sales hotspot. For all the things I've dealt with, I've always been amazed by there's actually not a lot of soil labs around yeah. the U.S. and Canada. Part of that is, I suppose, because as well, I think you should soil test everywhere. And I'm a big fan of zone soil testing through whatever methods. Certain parts of, let's say, the U.S. and even Eastern Canada don't agree with that as much, which whatever. They can talk yeah. to universities <laughs> people about that but i think there has been a lack of soil testing throughout all of ag so yeah. if you can get more people to do it 
through whatever methods, I think, as long yeah, as they're sound scientific practices. Yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a need and want. Data point in one of the reports, like in 2022, only like 60% of the growers, 60% of the growers don't soil test every, you know, year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that to me is like, you know, that's an opportunity where we can, you know, kind of really assist at a price point, which is, you know, not like egregious. And, but I guess the, my reason of bringing that up again was it came out of, just listening to our employees and, and saying, okay, where, you know, what are the customers saying? Or, mm-hmm. or what is the need out there? What is the unmet need which is out there in the market? And and we have the capability. So, you know, you marry the two. And so, yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, so. Milk and cereal make cereal. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's just listening to, listening to all, all, all the stakeholders, not just customers, but also the employees. So will that come, I mean, you know, in the beginning, it, I mean, Farmers that started as an agronomy company, is there still going to be a lot of regional agronomists everywhere or are you more, fo- are you focusing on that differently? Because I mean, that was always a core part is we're going to have agronomists everywhere. And almost it became a lot, yeah. almost too much. I mean, everyone had to pick up and this, there's just a lot of expenses around doing it. Is that shifting differently? Yeah, I think how are, how are we looking at this is like agronomists are, you know, key to key to this business. Like it, it just goes without saying, mm-hmm. you know, whatever level of technology you can, you know, bring in, it, it has to be augmenting what they are currently doing. So the way we are thinking about it is, you know, we want to really refresh, simplify our fertility offering because it comes, you know, with a complex package of, you know, things that, you know, we are going out with the, mar- you know, to the market. And so that's one thing that we are clearly doing right now. The second piece is, you know, it depends region by region in terms of what is our footprint that we want to operate. Because once you get certain economies of scale, then it becomes, you know, economically, you know, well, you can, you can overcompete with the yeah. local group. So, I mean, are you yeah. open? Are you opening up more to some of the other independents and saying, "Hey, do you work kind of with us?" Or is there? A- oh, okay. From that standpoint, so yeah, I personally and my team as well, we've had an a number of partnerships in this company in the past that we did not manage well. I'm going to all of those people with almost folded hands and saying, we are trying to reset and we're going to focus on what you need and how we can work together. Okay. You know, so that's that's a very, very strong, clear, simple message that I've relayed to my team because because like I said, everybody can coexist and, and we want to be complementary and not you know, competitive. So it applies to. You might just get a ton me. of emails after this goes out, and people saying, "Yeah, I want to talk." No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Which, hey, it, yeah. it, that's that's all great. So, um, you know, we've, we've been going on here almost an hour twenty. So, hey, good conversation, and I think it's all been great. Just some kind of more maybe maybe ending questions. Just looking over my list here. Oh, oh, one that I didn't, I know you, you've, you've talked a little about, about where, but, you know, before there was kind of a pullback, you know, locations where you are from Australia and there was some from yeah. Brazil and, and even from the United States, right. uh, where, where is the main concentration? Where's the main focus now, you know, worldwide or, or where's the different areas? Like what, what's, what's the key, key spots? Yeah. So Canada and the U S are clearly going to be the, you know, continuing to be the key market okay. for us. Brazil, and specifically Mato Grosso and Brazil, which is a region that we feel, you know, pretty bullish about. And I was there meeting, you know, a lot of customers, enterprise customers. You know, so US, Canada, Brazil are the key markets. Australia, we had to actually exit just because of, you know, the... Snakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could say snakes. Of course. Yeah, it was right. But, uh, yeah. That could have been the answer, and I've been fucking. But, uh, yeah, but I think just with the time zone challenges and the support that we weren't able to really provide to the team for the size of that business, yeah, I think it was the right. I would say short term. I would say you know decision. Well, I, I know a lot of groups from out there, and, and yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's tough for any outside group. I mean, it's yeah, a big island, yeah, time zone, like you said. So yeah, and 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 India, you know, is a is definitely a market which is on the radar for us because with the you know just the positive political landscape, you know, they've done an amazing job in digitizing the ecosystem there, mm-hmm. like on the financial side, on the banking side, on and, you know, so that's a market which is of, you know, high interest to us. And and we've launched this lab I told you about. We're doing some pilots with a, you know, with a large banking, 
you know, service provider there. Mm-hmm. They're actually, and, and I was actually surprised with the level of sophistication that they have, even in current state, like in terms of trying to improve on their analytics. Well, there's, there's a lot of countries like that. And I, I've written about it a little lately and I've, I've seen others is, you know, while the, the U S and Canada dominate in these certain parts or even Europe yeah. or Western Europe, there's a lot of developing areas of the world that yeah. they can just catch up so much faster, Yes, but they can also get kind of off guided really fast too. If you're not, if others from the outside aren't looking yeah. for those opportunities. So yes. I'm sure, I'm sure you're going through that. Yeah, you know, you know, it's list by list. <laughs> yeah, one of my other learnings at Amazon and even before, you know, was I think the the degree of centralization and localization, depending on the you know journey that you're on in that new market, is very very important. It's almost the probably the most important point because a lot of times, and I do this with like Brazil now runs on a decentralized model for us. Mm. Previously, it was a central operation where Canada was dictating what they need to do, and okay. and we don't have the you know, local nuance and know-how of what's going to happen. Language is a challenge, so on and so forth. So that model is now working well. And But any new market that we enter is going to be a function of, okay, what the need is and, you know, get the local experts, local partners, and then collaborate with them. Well, that, that is a different different path from before. Because, I mean, before that was a lot. It was like everything. I mean, there's a small group that was, I mean, and that's how businesses work sometimes, you know, yeah. kind of a, I'll call it a a mob mentality of sorts. Sometimes businesses need to do. They're like, this is happening. This is happening. There's all this. And at times you can, you can get really, you have to do it, but you can get at times you can get caught in that becoming the norm. And yeah, especially when things are across the world or in different cultures. I mean, it's agriculture. It is, you know, we, there's different cultures to every part of it. Totally. Yeah. Eastern North Dakota, where I live, and Western North Dakota are not the same. Yeah. Just within that region. I mean, and I'm sure Manitobans and Saskatchewanians, if that's what I don't know, people call them, <laughs> there, there's infighting there too. But no, I think that's a, that's a good point because I think that's another piece in ag that gets, especially with the groups that want to expand a lot or can, is they just try to kind of hold it too close and don't. Yeah. reach out and say, I need your help. Can you kind of just run this? Cause you know it, we're supporting you. Yeah. But can you figure it And that's, out? that's the right approach because I think your decision matrix, like you got to take decisions and sometimes you have to take decisions quickly without a lot of data, but you know, the, the balance lies in, you know, what's the right, you know, framework to account for the bottoms up inputs into your decision matrix mm-hmm. while you have the top down kind of direction. And and that comes from, you know, just keeping your ears open and listening and, you know, then trying to process the information and then, you know, take decisions, which are sometimes, Amazon had this, you know, quite kind of figured out there was a one-way door decision and a two-way door, like, you know, and it's, you know, two-way doors are relatively, you can make it, you know, fast and furious, one-way door decisions are, you know, I've just got to think a little bit more, so, you know. Speaking of that, I, I remember reading that they do this like three-pager do you, are you implementing that into to no, no, three picture? So that that's a very unique practice at Amazon. They don't use PowerPoints. They yeah. do a, so that's they, they do either a a two pager or a six pager, okay. you know, which is you know which is the version of the narrative, and then you can put as many pages in the appendix and and it's and it's a very good practice because it makes you think and through all the nuances and you know so yeah it's. it's a lot of document writing when I was there. I was reading about it. I just had to ask. I was going to ask that earlier, but because it can be really intense. It's still an intense process to yeah. like go through it. But but regardless, so I have kind of a one last main question. And, and this has been brought up for a few other people too. And I think it's just a general question around everything. And then I'll do some, we'll just do some closing thoughts. And, and then I, I'll probably have a little ending part of <laughs> myself. But Okay, with it's what year nineteen of Farmer's Edge, if I do my math correctly, because it started in 05. yeah, something like that. And you know, there's been a lot of chaos of things in the last ten years. You know, this growth, this, these ups and downs, and 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 big things. I've been asked this a lot, and a lot of people want me to ask this: Are you considered changing the name once you're going private? Because I think a lot of people think that is a path. They, they want it in a sense, but I, 
asking the source. Is that a has that been a talk or a consideration? Yeah, it's it's come up a few times in my discussions as well, and and I've thought about it too. But it's uh, I think personally, in spite of I would say the you know the history and the baggage. I mean, I I, I like the name, you know, because it's trying to really create an edge, you know, for the for the farmer. But but you know, as like. As you get more inputs, you know, things change. We may, you know, come up with a different name for, let's say, if the soil lab services take off and, sure. you know, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, and and I would have probably taken a much, a much deeper look at considering that if when I was going to the customers and I was getting shut out and nobody wanted to talk to me because I'm from, you know, Farmer's Edge. True, That true. That has not been the case. And, okay. and I've met, I would say, close to about... 80 plus customers last year, myself along with my team, different, you know, countries, different, you know, areas. And and they people have been extremely welcoming and positive. And I've had a personally a warm welcome into the agriculture community. I love the passion and that's good. And and, and they they want the company to do well. And and they're liking the fact that we are focusing on, you know, improving their experience and, and not run into an expectation mismatch. Well, and, and to that point, I mean, and and I've I I told you this right away, and I told some other people about it because they're like, "Why are you, you know, interviewing Farmers Edge? You've been a, one of the biggest critics, and all this and history, blah 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 stories that I've told." And and I've said to people, "Listen, okay, ag tech is a lot of things, but you know, traditionally, there's been this infighting, call it for just market share, over the last ten years with all the money and marketing and stuff. And I know a lot of people that just were getting tired of it." And I've seen friends, colleagues that, you know, didn't work. They had to sell for cheap or they just it didn't make it. And, right. they, and part of me has been like, you know, there's there's people that want fairly farmers edge to fail for whatever reason. There's people that want it to keep going. And I, I'll call it I was maybe more of a middle ground just because of my entire history around it and just everything. But I was thinking after after we talked and and I think I mentioned this is I mean, it doesn't matter how much I've criticized or looked deep or how others have. It's a, we're at a really crazy point right now because if anyone, if you guys fail, I mean, for all the stuff you've done and developed, that's going to put a lot of others down. It brings everyone down a little peg. Right. And it's actually better if it works because that means if you guys succeed still after all the, the rough patches and, and ups and downs is, oh, these people are using it. And there's plenty of pie to go around. Totally. You guys aren't going to control the world on this. And either is yeah. Bear or John Deere with every whatever. Yeah. Name, name your person. No, there's there's very low adoption now. It can yeah. only be it can only be up. So no, I, I I I think there's there's a lot I hope everybody that's listening to this can learn from just of where the change is and 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 how it's being approached and maybe take some lessons from it. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it as, as we're talking and thinking through it too, even in other, you know, future podcasts that I'll do, but kind of the end things, kind of some closing thoughts. I mean, where, where do you see the larger scope of future, the future for farmer's edge, or, or I guess if you would name it something different, but as a whole, it's got good brand recognition, you know, wh- whatever side of it you think of, what's the next five years look like to you? 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, and I like frameworks and I like phases. Like I said, we are in the second phase of the turnaround. And, you know, once after we go private, you know, we'll maybe make some other adjustments, you know, internally to the, to the business model, but, but the core is not going to change, but we're going to double down on the core offerings that we are bringing to the market. And that helps us get to cash flow break even, you know, and then we don't have these I would say conversations around profitability and are you going to survive, et cetera. And then I would say the phase three of that, you know, journey is going to be really how we double down on our expansion, working with enterprise partners, working with growers. And, you know, I see a lot of positive traction because because one thing is which is there in public companies, perhaps also more so in private companies, is you don't always get to see what's happening behind the scenes. And I'm a big believer in, you know, it's always a process. It's never an event, you know, the mm. media and the, you know, fishing houses and, and it's like, you know, they'll, it's always a flash in the pan and they want to have those type of stories. 
but they don't always have the insights into what's happening in the background and and you know i'm i'm going to be on the road again this year uh, you know trying to sell the solutions in a way that it makes more sense it's more palatable it's simple to understand it's not a significant dent on any customer's kind of pnl and that's how you create value and you start spinning that flywheel and and once you do that successfully for a year couple of years then the world is our oyster like you know in terms of how we kind of pan out so well yeah. like i said there's 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 in that term there's plenty of people there, there's not enough oysters being used anyway so there's plenty yeah. of, there's plenty of oysters in the sea yeah and uh, mm-hmm. i think i think if like kind of this i call it maybe some people will call it ag tech something point oh and I, I don't really have a term for it, but <laughs> I almost call it. It's like, let, let's just get, kind of get back to the basics. Right. Is, you know, we're trying a lot new. I mean, it started off as kind of wild, wild west, you know, and then it got into weird expansion. Like we just built buildings too fast in a yeah. sense. They were thrown together. Some, some were better than others and some crumbled. And now we're like, okay, now we know how to build a foundation. Now we know how to build a nice structure on top. We know how to make it pretty. Now we just got to get people to live in it. And like yeah. the house lasts for yeah. you know, at least 30 years or whatever. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's the next phase is just kind of getting back to reality. And from all sides, from investors to outside companies. I mean, there's with everything from, from climate change to politics to agronomics, technology, everything. There's a lot to do still and the more longer people are in it and i think and my goal is to have those back-end conversations with with people like you saying let's get to let's get to hear what is actually behind the curtain yeah because sometimes it's hard to it's hard to talk about for some because it's just it's weird (laughs) but i'm glad you're the first one to to be on my my new Ag Uncensored podcast. So, Vibor, thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming on and and having me here. And luckily, it wasn't too far away. And hopefully, everyone likes and shares and subscribes and 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 you guys share it out to as many people as you can. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. But and and for right now, I'm not doing any crazy advertising or anything either yet. So it's just kind of me trying to get a message out. And so I appreciate you doing for this, doing this, and. I guess that's all I got for now. Any any last closing words? No, I just want to say congratulations on your inaugural podcast, and uh, and I appreciate the opportunity, you know, and and the partnership to kind of allow me to come out and talk about you know where we are and you know where we are going, and but more importantly, I would say reset the narrative, you know, for our yeah. customers in terms of you know you've got the right focus and the right sentiment, you know, to make them successful. And yeah, good luck. I wish you a lot of subscribers and, you know, a successful podcast series. It'll turn into something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I can get it, get it done on the weekly that I, I plan to. I don't get that as much on writing. It's actually kind of why I wanted to do this. Cause I mean, we're here for about an hour and a half and, and then it's like writing a few paragraphs that takes like five minutes to read seems to take like four hours to write. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I need to switch that around a little bit. And Anyway, so anyways, thanks again for having me. And I'm going to end this main session here. And I'm, I have a little closing thoughts just around this conversation and kind of other things leading up into other other uh, episodes, I guess, coming forward. So thanks, everyone, for listening. And, and thanks for uh, having a good conversation. My pleasure, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Well, there you have it. Thanks for, for one, listening to... This interesting, call it first episode of my new podcast, and especially with a group like Farmers Edge, with with everything around it, as as we were kind of talking about, I wanted to do a little exit video here just to kind of go through my own little thoughts around it all. As as we all know, you know they're kind of a, a larger than life, call it brand in the ag tech space now for for many reasons, but overall. It was a great conversation, and I'm glad Vipor reached out to me to, for one, just kind of communicate through even some of those initial criticisms I had, and even from the past. And I think that shows a lot of someone trying to lead a business into a kind of a new light. And you know, I think he's got the the skills and the and the understanding to 
to, to run a business and, and try to do more with it. He, he clearly has had a role of expansion from previous previous work related stuff. And I think he's trying to reset the got the drive and the culture within Farmer's Edge, which is very important right now. Of course, they got a lot to do, but for meeting a few people over there as I as I travel to Winnipeg, I found people are people that are trying to they're trying to reimagine some things. They're trying to reset some things, and you know, there's there's still a lot of critics out there, and I'll still be a critic no matter what of of anything in ag tech. Just not to put anything down, just to try to get people to to, to think through it all a little more as especially right now it's it's a little complicated with with kind of the the environment of from adoption is low to you know the income in ag in general is down so that's going to affect everything and of course the investments in in ag tech are tough too and time will tell if 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 they can weather the storm and get through it all and provide that call call it different vision and brand approach and and value through their products i I think there is value there it's just they they have to do it a little differently this time and it's going to take it's going to take some work for sure so i I do commend them for for trying and to to get through the next point it seems like they they're they're going to keep on going and 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 they got a an interesting future forward and and i also don't want them to you know i don't want them to fail because I don't want anyone in ag tech to fail, even if I criticize them a lot and, or have given them a hard time with some of their past things they've done. It, it doesn't look good for the entire industry if, if groups have a hard time figuring it out or, or can't make it work. So I I hope them all the best and, and everybody else trying to, to learn into this kind of weird ag tech world. So, but some other final thoughts around them they still have some ongoing challenges there are some ongoing you know legal things they're dealing with the farm mobile case for instance is is not fully closed there's another court date coming up in may i believe around the the settlement amount i think it was 20 million and where that goes i don't know where that'll go that is a whole different discussion point but it's still a thing they got to deal with the PWS part two court date, there's not till the fall of 2025 from what I read. So that's a long ways away from now. And, and, and who knows where all that will, will, will lead them. Of course, they'll have their own challenges going from, from public company now to private back again and, and kind of regaining some of that trust as we talked about. So except they got, they got an uphill battle, but as, as we both iterated in there, there's been a lot of money spent on building tools and digital assets and, and there's, there's value there. It's just, can it be, I guess, put together right and the right story and the right value prop for, for others out there. Maybe that is still in Canada and the U S maybe it is in Brazil or India or, or other places, Africa, hard to say, but there's a lot of growth in other parts of the world too. So if some things don't work here, there's a lot of opportunity out there. There's no shortage of uh, possibilities. And I think one kind of final thing to note is, you know, with the adoption rate generally low in ag tech, especially using software and, and agronomic processes within that compared to the traditional kind of methods, there's a lot of places in this world that are kind of up and coming and catching up with with North America or Western Europe on their practices. So I... I think there's a lot to capture still. So as long as they can keep things kind of, kind of going, they, they, they might be fine. I guess, like I said, time will tell, but either way, that's my kind of overview of everything in a, in a very short <laughs> time frame. but I hope you enjoyed listening and, and watching. If you did on YouTube, uh, make sure to, to follow this podcast with the, the handle ag uncensored and all the major social media places that i have so far subscribe like comment uh, i'd be curious on what you think about it and please see me for my uh next guest and and following ones from there and uh hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time thanks <laughs>